Welcome uh, everybody to uh, the fifth uh, lecture for the seminar on neural networks uh, architectures um, presented at the Towards AI Discord server. And um, this uh, lecture is is um, it's good to see together with um, the lecture from uh, last week on CNNs because um, both CNNs and um, uh, recurrent neural networks can take uh, an input of variable size. And um, as we will see, the, but the size of uh, the input for uh, CNA, uh, for uh, recurrent neural nets is, is, is more unbounded than the size of inputs for CNNs. Uh, however, uh, both of them find some uh, limitations that, that in, a, in a way give them a maximum size. In the case of the CNNs, we have the uh, last layer, uh, the last layers of, of, of uh, an AlexNet-like architecture that uses a fully connected network and that gives you the maximum size of, of the input. In the case of um, LSTMs that we will see today, uh, they are normally compound with attention mechanisms and the attention mechanisms uh, will give you also a maximum uh, size. Um, but uh, if used uh, in an unbound uh, setting without attention, then they will uh, take uh, variable inputs. So let's uh, let's um, take a look about the topics for today. Uh, at the beginning of the lecture, we're going to talk about recurrent neural networks and how they are trained by unrolling and uh, the problem of banishing or exploding gradients. Um, we're going to discuss about internal memories and how they can be accessed and updated. And then we are going to, um, that will lead us into um, long-term, short-term memories, LSTMs, which are the main topic of, of today's lecture. Uh, we're going to discuss a number of variants, including the GRUs. And, um, and finally, we're going to look into encoder decoder architecture and um, the use of uh, attention uh, mechanisms to uh, make them work. All right, so uh, in this uh, uh, today's lecture, we are going to be working on with, with two different surveys. Um, this survey from uh, 2015 uh, takes uh, the long tradition of recurrent neural networks and uh, uh, summarizes the most important works. So beautiful, um, um, beautifully written review. Uh, if 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 you have. Um, some time to, to read it, it's, uh, it's, it's worth uh, the effort. Um, it discusses uh, plenty of, of, of um, interesting uh, details, like for example, in the papers for neural networks, the, the index, when you have a weight matrix, uh, some authors use the first index as the index of the input um, of the previous layer and the second index as the uh, neuron while others switch them and, and things like that. Uh, I, I did learn quite a bit uh, studying it. So uh, if you have a sequence learning, yes, that means that you have time dependent inputs or variable length inputs and, and like YC outputs, yes. Um, then one way to deal with that um, is to use uh, the, the concept of a recurrent neural net, yes, in which processing is done one element at a time. And, and that idea that the, the information is fed into the network one element at a time is one of the distinguishing features of um, RNNs versus <coughs> versus um, CNNs. In CNNs, um, we have this window and uh, that slides over the data, but that window processes all the information in that window at a time, and we can conceptually think that all these uh, windows as process also uh, at the same time. Um, Transformer network we'll see next uh, class also take all the input at once. The RNNs are um, different because they process one element at a time and uh, early work uh, started uh, focusing on biological plausibility but uh, later times have completely abandoned that idea but uh, when dealing with uh, variable length input, particularly time-dependent inputs, uh, humans and, and other animals, 
do receive the input one at a time, right? This is time dependent. So you receive one input at a time now and then next uh, time, etc., etc. So uh, that's that's a part that is uh, key to to uh, understanding um, the topic. Yeah. So this is um, the idea then of of the recurrent neural networks that they receive. Um, an input over time and that they keep some state to process that input. So the the key aspect of, of RNNs is, is the idea of a recurrent cell. You have a part of the network <coughs> that has a, a memory, this HT, and uh, at time T it receives some input, this XT, yes, uh, in the center um, uh, left, yes, and then it receives the HT minus one. It receives the memory at times uh, at the previous time. These things are fused, are uh, sent through a sigmoid operation, and then we output from there the um, <coughs> uh, output at time T and the memory at time T. Yeah, and. Uh, This, of course, gives us the question of how is the initial state set? Yes, I mean, once the network is working, we can uh, understand how uh, these uh, internal memories get produced. But uh, what happens with the first element? Well, so the first um, uh, initial state is normally taken to be at random or full or, or zeros. Yes, uh, a particular given value, but in general it's at random. And uh, with this, um, this is uh, something that we can program and, 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 and it will work, yes. Uh, the question is, of course, how can we, uh, how can we train this? Yes, uh, we have this uh, item there in red with a sigma that that's a whole uh, neural network. So um, how are we going to uh, process that? Um, but before we look into that, let's take a look at the uh, expressive power, yeah? And uh, the RNNs have this beautiful property that the, the, the expressive power grows exponential with the number of cells in the hidden state. So as we add more uh, neurons in the internal memory, their, their um, expressive power grows substantially. Uh, while on the other hand, training and inference only grows quadratic with the number of cells. And um, so that give us the, the feeling that we have a very powerful tool, and indeed they are a very powerful tool. And uh, the second thing that is uh, key here is that they can be trained end-to-end -end using stochastic, our favorite tool, stochastic gradient descent, uh, by unrolling, yes. And uh, we're going to see next an example of unrolling, but the, the whole idea of unrolling is to consider that each time step is a different layer but each layer has shared weights, yes? So here we we uh, go back to, to what makes CNNs uh, so powerful, is to have shared weights. The RNNs also have conceptual shared weights uh, at time of unrolling. And uh, through these uh, lectures on, on, on neural network, it's okay, we start seeing uh, ideas that allow you to um, um, build successful neural network architectures. Shared weight is one of them. Uh, Hardwiring links to 1.0, as we saw with ResNets uh, last lecture, and today we will see it with uh, with the LSTMs. It's, it's another of these uh, ideas, uh, these recurrent, uh, brilliant ideas that make things work. Yes. So, if if we have a network that is repeated at every time then, as I was mentioning, we can train them by unrolling. And uh, here is kind of like we take the picture we had before with, with the input and, 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 the, and the memory, yeah. And um, <coughs> kind of twist it, yes. And so the memory of, of, of time uh, t and uh, t plus 1, etc., becomes that um, uh, purple uh, arrow there, yeah, this uh, purple arrow here that goes through the center. Um, and there's uh, one purple arrow coming in from, from before, yeah? So you have the input, it goes through the hidden layer, and then it produces an output. 
So this is uh, a neural network that can be trained. It's a neural network that receives uh, four inputs and produces uh, four outputs. And uh, well, it does have much more neurons than the, the original RNN uh, because uh, we are considering we have a layer of neurons for each timestamp. Uh, the beauty of this is that if we consider that these neuro these layers have all the same weights, then this can definitely be trained. Yes, the problem is uh, the the gradients we are getting uh, are very close to the output, so th that that will uh, have a very hard time the error m modifying uh, errors at the earlier times in the network will not really affect the weights that much. The, the end uh, elements in the sequence will be much more important for calculating the errors than the errors at the beginning. And basically that's, that's what all this lecture is about, is how to improve over that situation, how to avoid the fact that the gradients will uh, disappear, what is called uh, vanishing gradients, yes? And, uh, and another way of thinking about it is that the connection between early elements in the sequence and later elements is lost, yes. And, and this is uh, in many places where the networks are, this network applied, for example, in, in, in machine translation, yes, in language modeling, um, that make them unsuitable, yes. For example, in German, if we have um, two, uh, two verbs, uh, a dual verb, like an auxiliary and, and, and a main verb, then the, the second verb goes to the end. And you have this strong link between the subject that is at the beginning of the sentence and, and the second word of the verb that is at the end. Yes, and that type of link will be lost in our, uh, RNN, uh, standard RNN. And this type of vanishing gradients is, is common with the sigmoid activation function. If, um, on the other hand, um, uh, the 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 accumulation of, of, of weights uh, for these errors is, is too much, like in R RELUS you have the op opposite uh, problem, you have exploding gradients, yeah? Uh, so if if the link between time t is, is, is more than 0, 1.0, then you get exploding gradients, if it's less than 1.0, you get vanishing gradients, there is no way of winning here, yes? Uh, all we can do is actually to use 1.0, to hardwire that connection, the connection here in purple uh, to uh, 1.0 and that gives the idea of having really an internal memory and the invention of the LSTMs. So the LSTMs have been around for a very long time, from 1997, under the, uh, well the name is long short term memory, and it's the first practical model that could do sequence le uh, learning. Uh, interestingly, the, the authors of, of, of the LSTM paper, I will not attempt to pronounce their names, um, presented them this way, which uh, I believe uh, may have uh, delayed a little bit the adoption because they, um, so that this, this image is accurate depiction of an LSTM, but it's uh, quite complex. Instead of uh, looking at the actual connections, etc., cetera, uh, this way, uh, we are going to start looking at these architectures in a much more abstract way, which is common for LSTMs, in which we consider the, the network um, in terms of uh, <coughs> um, l soft gates or, or logic gates. Yeah. Um, so, in LSTMs, the, the, the whole concept of LSTMs is that we have an internal memory, we have a block of neurons inside each cell that is connected to itself in the previous step, and these connections have weights hardwired to 1.0, yeah? And, uh, and that allows uh, to, to channel error through the sequence. <coughs> Early authors call this a constant error carousel. It's like you, you put some value of um, uh, the error that you are trying to, to backpropagate in there, and then you just move it around until it's needed. Yeah, I, I do like this constant error carousel quite a bit. It's, it's no longer used that term, but uh, I, I found it uh, lovely. And um, then, so so the, the values that go there are hardwired to one, but uh, 
to access it, yes, we, we use this idea of a logical uh, soft gate. It's, it's like a, a gate from um, um, computer architecture, yes, like an AND or XOR gate, but these ones are differentiable operations, which means, of course, that they can be trained. Yeah, and uh, these gates then, uh, at the level of implementation, is a weight matrix that we can learn that we combine with the memory values to produce an output value. Yeah, so we have a memory that we can, um, that is set, we're going to see how we set it, and then we have a, a way of, of picking part of that memory to, to do um, uh, predictions and, and calculations. Well, this basically means that we are building an, a, a program, yes, uh, these gates are, are the part of the algorithm, yeah, but the algorithm itself is, is, is differentiable, yeah, so the algorithm itself, the, the weight matrix, etc., is set through stochastic gradient descent, and, and that's, uh, of course, um, uh, fantastic, yeah. So we have a way of accessing it, that is, this way matrix multiplied by the memory, and we will obtain uh, the output. How do we change this uh, this memory? This memory is being copied, but uh, in a particular step we can change it, yes. Uh, so to change it, we take uh, also learned weights that we apply to the input, and uh, then we accumulate it I I in the internal memory. Yes, so this way the LSTM can decide when to read its memory and when to write it. Uh, that allows the network to skip over full segments of the sequence, yes. Not only it allows it to, to do that, to skip over full segments of the sequence, but it can learn when to skip, yes. Uh, this is very, very powerful for uh, natural language processing that tends to have um, the, the possibility of building telescopic uh, constructs. Yes, is is you can take any sentence in natural language and add uh, a very very long sequence of words in the middle as a parenthetical. Uh, that is very confusing for uh, machine learning algorithms because uh, all of a sudden you have all these words that are unrelated, most probably to the task we are trying to do, uh, but they uh, expand the length between the the uh, the contexts that are important. Yeah. So, with this mechanism that allows LSTMs to decide uh, to, to skip subsequences, yeah, uh, they can say, oh, well, here this is a parenthetical, this is not important, this is not relevant to the particular task, and I'm going to go through it and nothing will change, my internal state is not changed because there is no value over this. Um, uh, a little simple exam simpler example, if you are doing, instead of um, uh, natural language uh, processing uh, at the level of words, but at the level of characters, and you detect that what you have there is a complex um, uh, emoji using Japanese characters, uh, then you can just ignore it, like completely, like this is not even there, yes? And at the larger perspective, the fact that you have these gates that uh, are learnable, that means that the architecture is now the program. And uh, that's a very, very uh, powerful uh, concept to, to keep in mind. So, we saw uh, a survey at the beginning of the lecture that talk about RNNs in particular, uh, in general. This other survey that is uh, more recent by Young Yu and, and co others uh, looks in particular at just LSTMs. And uh, this is a uh, very, very, very interesting survey, particularly the time it came out, uh, because uh, the survey is written uh, as the LSTMs are the solution to um, uh, all problems, uh, but at the time it gets published, uh, they have already, um, the, the community have moved already to transformers. So, so it's interesting to, to see very clearly what transpired during the last decade, Yes, and uh, where the state of the art, in a way, um, uh, arrived. Um, something that I do like quite a bit, particularly from this survey, is the fact that we understand LSTMs really well by now. Uh, we understand them uh, much better, I believe, than transformers. Uh, so, so in that perspective, um, 
if you are dealing with with new data uh, that has a uh, sequential in nature uh the LSTMs uh, can help you significantly because there is all this understanding about when they work and when they don't. And, and that understanding is summarized in, in, in this survey. Um, some of the things that are uh, discussed there is, for example, uh, somebody did a search over 10,000 different LSTM variations of, of the LSTM cell. Yes, so, so somebody... Uh, it's, it's kind of like a hyperparameter set. It's, it's actually a network architecture search, the topic of the last uh, lecture of the seminar, but only about the type of um, networks, uh, units that you can put uh, in here. So these are variations of the recurrent cell. And through that, they, uh, they found some variations that were not published. And they, of course, found many variations that are, are, are popular. So the, this is uh, the slide you most probably are familiar with uh, describing LSTMs. Um, and here you have the, the input and the output gates uh, we were talking earlier. So you have um, at the lower level here, XT, the input at time T. We have the, <coughs> uh, the memory at time uh, HT minus one. And then uh, the output uh, we are producing, that, that should be um, this uh, C sub T. So, well, here you have this presented at the level of these uh, soft logical gates. Uh, <clears throat> uh, at the end of the day, these are all neural networks. These are all uh, weight matrices uh, multiplied and, and uh, there is now uh, the, this. These diagrams look a little magical, but this is um, end up being all linear algebra plus uh, uh, non-linearities in the form of, of uh, squashing functions. So what you get here is it comes the, the input, and um, from the um, uh, <clears throat> Um, we use the input and the previous memory to decide uh, which parts uh, we are going to access uh, from the memory. And then we decide from uh, here which ones we are going to uh, use to um, produce the output. Yeah. So this is the original um, uh, setting of uh, <coughs> of the LSTMs. Just we take the the input and we uh, use it to modify the memory, and we take from the the input and we decide which things we are going to use to, to produce an output. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's fine. But the problem this uh, architecture has is that it it quickly saturates the internal memory because we are only adding to it. Yes. All the, the only operation we have is, is this operation of uh, uh, incrementing the information. And uh, so unless the, the, uh, the sequences are short, they saturate very quickly. So what uh, other others um, do later on is to add a forget gate that um, then from the input decides to set certain parts of, of the internal memory to zero. Oh, okay. So this is very confusing, and I was a little confused too. Um, this diagram has is a different nomenclature than the previous one. Z is internal memory, and H is the outputs. So we receive here the input from the previous time, and we use that to uh, to decide whether to set the memory, and then from there uh, we um, also decide. Um, how to um, so we say how to read it and we decide how to set it out and this is the output at that particular time this ht is the output and c sub t is the new memory this is the only way this diagram works because then this is how you will get the forget gate the forget gate uses a xor type of operation so uh, from here, using this learn weight matrix, we can decide that uh, we, ca we we want to set certain parts of the memory to zeros, 
and um, and then we will accumulate using the input and we will uh, compute an output from there. All right, so uh, these LSTMs defined this way can learn context-free uh, grammars, can learn to count. They are really, really expressive uh, uh, constructs. Yes, um, there are other, um, uh, but. The more you you add complexity, the more network, more neurons you have to train, and the more uh, likely is that uh, the the system won't stabilize, won't won't be able to learn uh, all that complexity. So uh, many of the var variants that uh, were proposed afterwards have to do with uh, how to simplify them, so um, they are uh, can learn better from the available data. Yes. Uh, other um, techniques involve using the same uh, cells, but combining them in more complex architectures that uh, address some of the problems that the LSTM have and um, uh, are more effective in general, yes, or, or can uh, express uh, more things or things uh, more easily. So let's take, uh, discuss a little bit about some of those variants. Uh, so there were, as I mentioned, there's even a paper that analyzes 10,000 different cell structures, but the most common variant aside the original LSTM with a forget gate is the GRU, which we will see next. Other type of variants involve stacking multiple uh, LSTM cells, where the first one receives the input and the other receives as input the output of the previous layer. And this, as I mentioned, significantly increases the expressivity of the system. Uh, a particular type of stacking that is very popular in, in the natural language processing is bidirectional, uh, bidirectional uh, LSTMs. Yes, and um, there is a whole field of bidirectional uh, recurrent neural nets. Yes, and the idea is that we take two LSTMs and we run them side by side. One receives the input in order and, and it behaves as a normal LSTM, while the other one receives the input in the reverse order. And the output of the system is the concatenation of both networks. Um, and they also can be stacked, etc. Uh, this, this is one of the most common variants at the moment. But of course, this network cannot be used uh, on real-time data, cannot be used uh, in a streaming manner. We cannot use it unless we, we know where the sequence stops and, and we can reverse it. Um, the survey discuss uh, many, many other LSTM variants, um, three-dimensional LSTMs, three-based LSTMs. Um, I, I, that was the first time I was uh, hearing about all these different variants. I, I believe they haven't picked up uh, steam as much as, as these other versions, but uh, it is quite interesting to see the depth the field studied the, the problem. And uh, it's also interesting, we will see in the next class, uh, how much uh, depth also has been applied to studying transformers. It's just that transformers is a much complex uh, animal, so to speak. But uh, I, from uh, this service, I feel we have an understanding of STMs that is much deeper at the understanding we had at the time the transformer um, uh, survey we will see next week uh, w was published. So, by far the, the most common um, variant is the GRU and uh, it has less parameters, it's less expressive. Uh, for instance, it cannot uh, taught to count, yes, but uh, in a way it's like if you can solve the problem with the GRU, uh, you most probably have a, a stronger and better solution than if you have to resort to a full LSTM. Um, and where does the GRU achieve this uh, reduction of parameters is by combining the input and output gates into an update gate. So the forget gate is, is now called a reset gate and, and we see that uh, this uh, network has no output, yes, because internal memory becomes the output. 
and that way then uh, well, we have much less uh, gates much less neurons to, to train and uh, but interestingly these um, modifications uh, do uh, affect uh, the, the um, expressive power o of the cell and the network itself. Okay, so we are uh, getting to the most interesting part of, of, of the, uh, today's lecture, that is uh, how to use these LSTMs in an encoder-decoder architecture. Yeah. We, we already talked a little bit uh, about uh, encoding and decoding when we saw autoencoders, yes? As we uh, remember from uh, the structure learning uh, class, an autoencoder takes an input, um, it produces a bottleneck in the middle, and from there it tries to reconstruct the output. And the, the activation pattern in the middle is, uh, is an embedding that represents the input. Yeah, so the encoder-decoder is a general uh, way of, of considering that, yes, and if we use an LSTM as the input, as the encoder, and an LSTM as the decoder, then we can take a variable length input, and that variable length input is going to be represented by a fixed size vector of floating point bar, uh, values, which is the, the internal memory at the end of the encoding process, and that's the embedding, yes, the same as, as the one we have with the autoencoder. And the decoder starts working from the embedding and produce a variable length output yeah uh, in this case the <coughs> first input to the decoder is uh, the embedding and subsequent inputs to to the lstm cell is the output from the previous <coughs> uh, network yeah and that gives us uh, an end-to-end -end trainable sequence transducer a sequence transducer is something that um, eats sequences and produces sequences, yes? Um, when um, we, we can think of the embedding as a summary of, of, of the whole input. And it doesn't matter how long and how, how short is the input, the embedding is always the same size. Um, if we were to write this as, as a program that, that we sit down and code, uh, well, we we'll just have to decide what, what information is important to keep inside this uh, floating point vector, inside this embedding, that uh, can be used to produce the output. Um, many times wh when we start studying encoder-decoder systems, then we, we start thinking, well, well how is this embedding comes about? H how is the meaning of the embedding is negotiated between the encoder and the decoder? Uh, and the part that is uh, really, really fantastic about this whole thing and, and, and the fact that this uh, systems can be trained end-to-end uh, -end using um, encoder uh, so stochastic gradient descent is that um, the meaning is negotiated between the encoder and the decoder as is they are trained end-to-end. -end. Uh, the meaning of each uh, value inside that uh, embedding vector is opaque to, to humans. It's just something that these two networks have agreed upon and are useful to solve this task. Um, that is really cool, on the other hand it makes debugging or understanding this system much harder. Now, due to the, we, we, even though we use these hardwired um, links to 1.0 and uh, etc., we still have vanishing gradient problems. So the, the embedding might not include as much information about the earlier elements in the sequence. Uh, this can be ameliorated somewhat by using a VLSTM, in which case the embedding is a concatenation of the forward and backward embeddings. But uh, in a way, many problems, yes, uh, the intermediate outputs uh, are meaningful for the decoding units. Yes, uh, for example, uh, if you are trying to, um, if you are doing uh, translation from one language to another, yeah, uh, then uh, so so the, the idea is that the output for a, a particular element, the encoding for a particular element, say encoding the element number five may be very important for the, deco um, the decoding of another element, for example, element number seven. 
yes, which is the one who is more related just because of the nature of, of the problem, yeah. Um, for example, if if the inputs are words in, 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 in Spanish and the outputs are words in English, yes, uh, you can imagine that in certain moments of the decoding, the words that were related to, to this context that is being translated, the, the output of the encoder for those words are quite important for, for the decisions, yes? Uh, or, for example, if your input are a little um, uh, square uh, inside an image and the output are words in English, yes, then of course the squares, uh, like if you have a large image and you are doing caption generation, yeah, uh, and you have a rose and then you have a person next to the rose and then a bunch of other things really far away that person and that is, is much more relevant for when you are talking about the rose yes and that's what you can want to say the, the the rose next to the person or things like that so that information is 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 not available in a normal encoder decoder architecture unless somehow they manage to pack it inside the embedding um, so how can we make these intermediate outputs available for decoding? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> well, we can feed all these decoding outputs, uh, all these encoding uh, outputs to the decoding units. But that will make the decoding units a variable length processing unit, which is what we are trying to avoid. Yes. So instead, what we do is we combine this intermediate output into a single input that is appropriate for a given decoding, yes? So, so we make a, a summary of, of all these intermediate outputs that is relevant for that particular element. Yes, so if we were saying that the element 5 is, is important for decoding element 7, what we say is that we make a summary of all the elements that were encoded that stress element 5 and we feed that to when decoding element 7. And therefore then this summary is, is combination weights that can be learned. And that leads us to the concept of attention. And uh, attention was uh, proposed and, and it was a concept that uh, evolved in the field uh, coming from different uh, directions. Um, I, uh, the citation I have here for neural <coughs> tree machines, which is a fairly difficult paper to, to grok through, um, I have it because in this paper it describes the most general concept uh, of attention that you can have. Yeah, and uh, so that this summary of encoding output for a given decoding input, neural tree machines uh, paper uh, highlights the fact that this summary is is really we are addressing a memory yeah so if if we have say 20 units that were uh, encoded yes when well, we have 20 <coughs> intermediate outputs so that's a memory of size 20 and we are trying to access that memory uh, the interestingly the interesting thing about this this paper is that it discusses that there are two ways to access that memory. One is by location. We can say, well, I want the item in positions five. But another one is one we, we uh, discuss uh, in, in lecture two, the Hoffield networks, content addressable uh, systems. We, we want to find something in, in there that is similar to something else. And um, the beauty of the, the algorithm proposed in this paper is that it combines both ways of accessing the network through a uh, trainable end-to-end uh, -end system uh, to, to weights that are, can be learned by training end-to-end. -end. And, uh, and this is the, the system they have. You, you have the previous step and then you can do content addressing using certain inputs or uh, you can do um, specific uh, item addressing using a, a mask that can also be uh, learned. So, the, as I mentioned, the paper is quite complex, but this is the most general case of, of attention that you, you might find. And um, from the perspective of uh, what is attention, th this allows you to um, have a, a deeper um, idea. Now, uh, 
an attention defined this way as, as a general way of combining things uh, of, of uh, inputs and outputs uh, end up having weight matrices that are quadratic on the maximum sequence length. I also note that while adding this type of attention mechanism, you are restraining uh, the maximum possible length of a sequence. Yes, a regular encoder decoder can process variable length input. Yes, uh, while an attention system has an idea of a maximum sequence length. In practice, the idea that an encoder decoder train on, on on sentences of length 20 applied then to sentences of length 40 and, and will work and produce a, a good output is is, is not uh, correlated with, with what I have seen in practice. Like the, the system uh, suffers significantly when the input gets too long. Yeah, so in reality, even with this maximum sequence length, attention systems uh, allow uh, an LSTM to, to process much, much longer um, uh, sequences, yeah? Uh, well, but these wave matrices are quadratic, yes? So that that's uh, a problematic in a variety of, of cases of, of, for a variety of reasons, in terms of training them, in terms of storing them. Um, somehow this can be reduced using dot product as in the attention of all you need uh, paper we will uh, see next class. But um, the, the problem with these weight matrices is, is, is quite a key problem for attention that is completely inherited in, in the transformer architecture. Um, so this is what I have for today. Uh, I have used uh, LSTM ex extensively in uh, um, uh, sequence tagging for natural language processing, like name entity recognitions or um, uh, parameter argument uh, finding in, in chatbots and things like that. Is what is called the beginning inside outside tagging. Uh, they work well with data in the tens of thousands. If you have less data, I still prefer CRF that are a pretty deep learning the methodology, conditional random fields, so statistical uh, learning. If you have much more data or if you have pre-trained models available, of course, transformers are, are significantly better. Um, something I would like to mention is that there seems to be a persistent idea that LSTMs are good for time series. I, I, I haven't really, uh, I, I haven't corroborated that. And, and to, outside traditional time series uh, mechanisms, if we're going to use machine learning for time series, I prefer use lag features and statistical classifiers like SVMs or, 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 or uh, random forest. I, I have uh, plenty of example code uh, in my uh, book's uh, website. Uh, LSTMs and transformers, in a way, are, are like a brand and uh, as a brand, they have attracted a lot of attention that give them a little bit of like mystical or magical attributes. Uh, in a way, the, I, I can see that for transformers, but for LSTMs by now, we have such a deep understanding about them that uh, uh, we, we shouldn't fall into that type of trap. The LSTMs are powerful tools, uh, but uh, they, they have limitations and we, we shouldn't let uh, them fool us. Uh, so, okay, so this is what I have for today. I'm really looking forward for the Transformers uh, lecture next week. And thank you so much for joining. Let's uh, talk a little bit about the questions you might have and um, the seminar. Thank you.